Hello. Hello, everybody. So you had your good lunch, I hope. I hope everybody's full now. So to start off the first session right after lunch, we'll have a debate. So it's more exciting and you can decide where you are, whether you're the pro or the con. I'll introduce the chairperson for the debate. Our Dr. Sharidan, you have seen him perform just now. You saw him in fully gowned with masks and all. So, Dr. Sharidan, who is the scientific committee chairman, who will chair this uh, pro con debate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson. Uh, I think if you look at the the schedule, uh, it was supposed to be Prof Associate Professor Shanas, but apparently there's nobody else to cover his ICU in UMMC. So he's basically I'm I'm sitting for him. Uh, okay, so the Hopefully, uh, I know our vagal tone is a bit high now, So, but since it's a debate, then uh, hopefully you guys uh, will be entertained by our esteemed debaters here. The, <laughs> the, the title of the debate is Facia Iliaca Compartment Block is a block of choice for uh, hip surgery. Uh, for proposing the topic will be Dr. Mafizira Mamat. Dr. Mafiz is, uh, um, so basically is one of the leading members of the special interest group of general anesthesia. Uh, currently, uh, would be soon my colleague in Glen Eagles Medini, uh, previously of uh, KPG Rawang and UITM. Okay, uh, he has done a fellowship in uh, Royal Perth Hospital. Um, and the opposing the topic will be uh, Dr. Victor Chi. Dr. Victor Chi is, I think, the earliest Southeast Asian who has done the proper uh, regional anesthesia fellowship. And uh, and he hails from Singapore, uh, and uh, I think uh, these two uh, debaters will enlighten us on the topic and entertain us. So, without further ado, I would like to invite. Uh, okay, so the 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 format will be about ten minutes uh, each, and then about five minutes or so each uh, in uh, rebuttal. So, you know, uh, the, each uh, debater will have uh, two uh, appearance. Okay, without further ado, I uh, invite Dr. Mafizar Mamat uh, to uh, propose the topic Facial Ilaka Compartment Block is the Block of Choice for Hip Surgery. Please. Okay, time starts now. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. And a very good afternoon. I know we are just after lunch and uh, I do hope that whatever the topic that we are presenting and talking about today would go deep into your minds and don't worry this is not a multi-level marketing <laughs> uh, deb uh, debate or, or presentation all right first like a compartment block is the block of choice for hip surgery so I will be giving that definition in terms of that topic initially that we've given been given the angle of justification my arguments and of course a bit of the closing all right, this is the particular uh, uh, hip joint that we're talking about. As you can see, a complex uh, arrangement made by God. Yeah? And uh, the function that can uh, uh, make us function well, walking around like I'm doing now. Again, hip joint, what are the nerve supply? We're talking about the femoral nerve, anterior division obturator nerve, the nerve to rectus femoris, nerve to corus femoris, cytic nerve, superior gluteal nerve. So with the complex structure comes the complex innovation. Again, in, we make it simple. We know that hip innovation, the anterior part, and the, from the uh, femoral nerve, the obturator nerve, and the sciatic nerve. Okay. So hip surgery. Hip surgery, I think, as, you, as mentioned before, the hip joint. And from the hip joint, we know that any kind of injury that we need to do an operation on or the, uh, the particular injury, we can, oh sorry, we can talk about the fracture neck of femur or hip arthroplasty. All right. So again, as you know, from the topic that we've been given, it's not that I'm talking that fascia uh, like block is the block, the, the, the only block or the only method that you use for hip surgery. What I'm saying is how we can see in, say, the nice uh, hip fracture management in terms of anesthesia. Of course, one of the recommendations is offer choice of either regional or general anesthesia and consider intraoperative nerve block for all patients undergoing surgery. That is my angle. Again, a Cochrane Library, which uh, I think last uh, published in 2010, where looking at for the hip nerve blocks for the hip fractures, all the subcostal, lateral cutaneous, femoral, triple, and so on. Again, uh, there's no substantial saying one better than another, but it is considered that 
all these blocks that you give would give uh, significant pain relief to the patients. Again, I mentioned that fascia like a compartment block is the block of choice. Again, as we know that the uh, since Dallas described the particular uh, fascia like a block in 1989, it has uh, received a lot of attention from a number of anesthetists and regionalists in terms of providing uh, an alternative to the femoral block or the three-in-one block. My points would be one, fascia like a compartment block, simple. Analgesia endpoint achieved for the surgical program perioperatively. And we're talking about the whole program, that means before, inter, and post. Complications less and economical. And when we talk about the providing analgesia, uh, what about simplicity? Simplicity is because of the, its basic anatomical knowledge. You know the anatomy, right? Then you would know that where exactly in terms of the description and uh, of course, the easy learning curve, this has been proven as well on teaching of how to do one. I guess this is one of those blocks where I do encourage my trainees before that at least the one block that you can do or do after going for this is fascia ilaka block. Huh? Because this can, uh, is, is safe. And of course, we are talking about the landmark and technology. All right, let's go just through about the anatomy. As you know that when we look into the anatomy, there will be the fascia lata and fascia ilaka. So description for... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, for description for the landmark technique would be the distance between, and you would try to give your local injection somewhere around this, uh, basically after the second pop, which is the fascia ilaka, and the distribution of the local anest anesthetic that should cover at least the fem both femoral block and the lateral femoral cutaneous block uh, nerve, and at to a certain extent, uh, obturator. But that can be something that we could further discuss about. Yes, simplicity. As you can see in our brochures, and why we do this here, and what our motto. Now, every anesthesiologist can block. Just like now, everybody can fly in Asia. So, bringing that back, everybody can block with the fascia ilaka. So, why not? Uh, this would be just uh, the description of particular studies which show how the administration of the local and uh, the fascia ilaka block is easy in terms of uh, by the junior doctors or even the healthcare. Uh, uh, carers. Again, Fasad telling again, 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 eh? Fasad like a compartment block is the block of choice for hip surgery. Alright, next, when we talk about superior analgesia component, we're talking about the perioperative analgesia it provides. As we know that recently, I think recent, our counterparts in the emergency, emergency physicians are very interested in this block in terms of giving that educate pain relief and provide I mean, good management of pain program if they come in with fractures or injuries that require surgery. And as well as well, we are talking about the opioid sparring properties in terms of the population, the elderly population that we happen to get these hip fractures. So we're reducing uh, things like delirium, etc. Uh, for this. <laughs> okay. okay. Now, another Cochrane uh, Library uh, database system review, which actually log, and this is uh, one literature which actually put and see the fascia ilaka block and say, telling us in terms of safety because this is in children, all are based in terms of in the systemic review are uh, the uh, fascia ilaka block. However, of course, the evidence is not superly strong in terms of saying, yes, we 100% recommend it. But yeah, that would be something that something for you to know in terms of what we have. And hopefully we further, uh, uh, what do you call it, for further research done that we would be more confident on that point. All right. Low complication rate. Here, I guess in terms of anatomy, when we look, when we talk about the position or L of the local anesthetic deposited and also the low concentration, because we're talking about volume. I think there will be some argument on the volume and in terms of safety, but when you consider where you actually deposit, okay, now it says in the ultrasound technique, you know your fascia lata and then your fascia ilaka, so you want to give in this particular plane, as, well, as we all know, fascia ilaka is a plane block. We do not really aim directly, but we are hoping, I mean, not to say hoping, we know that the spread in the plane, would, uh, the local anesthetic would cover the nerves that means uh, uh, the, uh, what we aim for. Example, if we do a femoral block, so either it's in ultrasound either or before in terms of uh, the landmark technique, we know that the position of the femoral nerve can be variable. And this is where, when we talk about safety, we are worried about neural injury that which can occur, whether under ultrasound or not under ultrasound, 
uh, to the femoral nerve compared to the fascia ilaka. You know, the deposit is definitely a distance away, even at that moment of normal anatomy, unless it's uh, not uh, normal anatomy. All right. And as I think here, why I'm putting this, but again, please take this uh, with a pinch of salt because I'm not saying that they, you can have neuro, uh, neurological complication because we know that the neurological complication is very, very small number, percentage of possibility. But what has been described that the uh, estimator of rate of cure uh, like femoral nerve block is 0.3%. All right. So that can, can, can cause that coming soon. All right. Okay. Cheap. Definitely. All right, you don't need ultrasound, you can still do your fascia block, it can work. Okay, that's why in terms of teaching and getting the juniors to do, you're happy and confident and you know that the patient will achieve the analgesia that they want. And now maybe something on disaster anesthesia is quite interesting that they are actually doing this. Uh, it's, it's, it's in the uh, study protocol for disaster, you know, in the low resource, low, uh, low resource, resource uh, areas or in the disaster where what you want to do if you have something that easy and worked. Uh, and this study will actually compare between uh, uh, morphine, fascia ilaka block, lemma technique, and ultrasound guided femoral nerve block. Fascia ilaka kopama block, again, this is simple. Oops, it's simple. The analgesia endpoint, the few complications, and economical. Safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mafis. So those were the points for facial lacquer block uh, in hip surgery. Um, we will have uh, a differing view uh, on the opposite view, uh, which uh, will be uh, elaborated on by Dr. Victor Chi. Uh, whenever you're ready, Dr. Chi. I feel obliged to do the MLM thing. Uh. <laughs> but uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh. Uh, thank you for inviting me back to Malaysia. It's always a pleasure to come back to meet uh, people who are close to my home. Uh, and uh, to a large extent, I think we think alike in many ways. Uh. Just a show of hands. Uh. Okay, the question of the day is the uh, fascial iliaca component, uh, compartment block uh, is the block of choice for hip surgery. Uh. How many of you already believe that this is correct? How many of you? Come on. Everyone must raise a hand at one point in time, okay? So if you lower your hand, that means you don't believe it, okay? If you believe it, so about maybe about 40% of you all believe it. Okay? Now my job now is to convince you that this is rubbish. <laughs> Now, the fascia ilaka block is well established in pre-operative management of hip fracture patients. Uh. Okay, that's what the literature says. That's what the practice guideline says. First responders are using it. The ER is using it. In the general ward, they're using it for pain management. But remember, we're talking about hip operations today. And this is talking about pre-operative management of hip fracture patients. Okay, I have no quip about this statement. Okay. But for hip operations, if you want to tell me and convince me that fascia ilaka compartment block is a way to go, then the science actually doesn't really tell you. I'll show you why. Okay, yes, in the literature like I mentioned earlier, in anesthesia in North America, in Europe, right, in trauma journals, right, everyone says that yes, we should use fascia ilaka blocks for hip fracture patients preoperatively. The fascia iliaca block is a really single short block with no needle redirection. And really what it is is, a, is what regional anesthesia has become today. Uh, there are blocks that are looking for indications. Okay? We really don't know what to do with this block, but let's just see what we can find to poke, you know, with. And you know, we, we are very romantic about putting a single injection somewhere to be able to do everything. Okay? So, I think he was trying to sell to you that if you put a single injection under the fascia iliaca, you can do good for all your hip operation patients. Well, I don't think so. Okay. 
There are three things I want you to think about, okay, over the next 10, 10 minutes or so. That hip operations are, it's not one animal. Uh. There are actually a whole bunch of animals there. Okay. The second thing is that the, the unpredictability of the fascia helical block uh, is actually quite clearly uh, laid out in the literature. When we say fascia helical block, uh, we mean an anterior approach to the lumbar plexus block. That means complete successful blockade of three nerves, the lateral cutaneous nerve, the femoral nerve, and the obturator nerve. Okay. So I'm going to show you that this doesn't happen. The third thing is that what then is the best option for hip operations? Okay. Is there really one option? So we look and do this first. Uh. It's, it's a basket of fruits. Okay? The hip operation is not one fruit. It's a basket of fruits. If you want to find a silver bullet, good luck to you. There may be three silver bullets, but I don't think there's one silver bullet. Okay? The hip fractures per se, there are many types. You all understand? Uh, if you work long enough, actually all of us are very good orthopedic surgeons. Okay? <laughs> Honestly, I can tell the junior what to do, what to do, what to do. If you miss something, I can tell you what you miss. Okay? And as far as hip fractures are concerned, uh, there are intracapsular, extracapsular, intertrochanteric, subtrochanteric. You know, there are many combinations to this. And because there are many combinations, there are many solutions. Okay? So if you are trying to convince me that your one block uh, can solve all these problems uh, that are created by our surgeons, uh, I find it very hard to believe. And just a bit of an anatomy. Okay, we all know that the hip joint is supplied by three nerves, right? There are branches from the femoral nerve, there are branches from the obturator nerve, there are branches from the sciatic nerve. Okay, that's a true fact. But this is the joint only. Don't forget that when you're doing surgery, you're doing soft trauma tissue that, that you intentionally create, right? And is there anything that can completely do this? Block everything? Well, I think there is, okay? And it's in the central neurexis, uh, it's not in the peripheral nerve. Okay. So, but a lot of us forget that actually on top of the joint, we also need to look after the soft tissue during the surgery. And if you remember the, the mapping of the skin and the soft tissue around the area, um, sorry, we move back one, right? Uh, the lateral cutaneous everyone knows. Uh, Right? Oh yeah, the lateral cutaneous nerve is there, you know. So even if you approach the hip from the anterior aspect, uh, you can still cover it. But look, you know, down here, if you make a posterior lateral approach, uh, you're actually encroaching on the lateral thoracic nerve, the branches of the ilio, uh, hypogastric, as well as the superior cluneal nerves. These are the posterior divisions of L1 to L3. Uh. Many people don't really understand that, you know, the buttock uh, is supplied by L1. So the uh, the gluteal nerves, uh, sorry, the cluneal nerves actually also penetrate the, the gluteus maximus and come superficially. So you can imagine in a posterior lateral approach, uh, you actually split the muscle. Uh, it's going to be painful. Uh, okay. Now, in the post-operative management of hip fracture patients, there is also clear indication um, from FOSS that different operations cause different amounts of pain. Uh. Here we have pain at rest, pain on flexion, uh, pain on walking, and then the cumulative pain. Okay. On the bottom, uh, sorry, it's all very small. These are screws and pin fixation. This is either by hemiarthroplasty or total arthroplasty. This is by DHS or intramedullary uh, nail. Okay. So on the x-rays that we show, I showed you earlier, there are many combinations of the solution to this fracture problem. And you can, actually, it's, it's quite... I mean, if in your practice, you haven't come across it. Uh, total hip replacement uh, is actually not, not very painful. Uh. Okay? So there is data, and this is correct, that actually if you do a complete hemiarthroplasty, uh, it's actually not as painful uh, as having a DHS, uh, IM nail done, or even just screws put in for fracture neck or femur fixation. Uh. So ironically, uh, if you take out the whole joint, uh, it's less painful than leaving bits of it in. Uh. Now, also on this angle, the cumulative pain uh, for hip operations uh, is actually much less for knee operations. And this is true in clinical practice as well. So if we look at this data right, from uh, Frederick Seiber, who is a geriatric anesthesiologist who believes that we must reduce narcotic use for all patients, which is correct, right, for hip operations, right, 
um, we are talking about okay if you convert a uh, op day uh, by one milligram uh, per kilo it's about seven milligrams uh. oh. per kilo did I get it right point one point seven is the maths right the maths is right, right? Yeah. This is just stage anxiety, right? <laughs> the maths is right, yeah. yeah. So, you know, here we're looking at first post op day, uh, 16 milligrams of morphine. Uh. What does that equate to? Uh? Morphine running at 1 milligram or less uh, an hour. Uh. Is that a lot of morphine? How many agree that that's a lot of morphine? 0 0.8 milligram per hour. No, not a lot, right? Okay. Okay, this is compared to knee replacement, uh, where on the op day uh, you expect to give the patient about 48 to 50 milligrams of morphine. On the first post op day, they, they require about 24 milligrams of morphine. Okay, so in terms of total heat arthroplasty, also here we look at. I always look at the other data ex except the conclusions. Uh. So we draw from this study again that again the morphine consumption uh, here up to 12 hours is only 11 milligrams, right, and for 24 hours is only 15, and at two days, uh, it's only 17 milligrams. No? That's not a lot of uh, morphine f uh, for, for hip replacement. And again, in uh, the recent publication by the NYSOR group, right, uh, again, this is for fascia alaka block. Right? Uh, don't look at the fascia alaka block data first, just look at the morphine consumption. Uh. 50 milligrams, though. No? In North America, the people feel a lot of pain, okay? okay? 50 milligrams on for 24 hours compared to what uh, Frederick Cyber's data was showed earlier. So, I hope I've been able to prove to you uh, that this animal uh, is actually uh, not one single animal. There are many breeds. Uh, uh. And because of that, if you think that one thing can solve all the problems, it cannot. Uh. Now, Next, we go on to the unpredictability of the fascia iliaca block. Uh. Originally described by Dalens, right, it was supposed to be the solution to a lumbar plexus block, which was very difficult in those days. Right? So the solution was that we just tuck it under the fascia iliaca, we give enough volume, it will spread everywhere, and then it will block all the three nerves. And then we approach it from that way. It's like, it's like saying, uh, you know, we give... Uh, we give the axillary block, right? If you give enough volume and push it hard enough, right, you'll get bilateral epidurals. <laughs> uh, which is true, which is correct uh, if you put it intraneurally sub epineural. Uh, if you push it like this, uh, you will get bilateral epidurals. But we're not trying to do that, okay? So, in his uh, original uh, paper, he showed, wow, massive spread, you know? Very nice, you know? Uh, and the spread. Compared to the three in one block, right? This three in one block, oh, only like this. But wow, with the fascia alka block, can spread everywhere. But remember, uh, these are pediatric patients uh, where the bone plates are still there. Mm -hmm. They are small people, right? They can spread very, very widely, la. Oh. So in comparison, like I mentioned, uh, these are small people, right? Point one, uh, point seven years old. Right, to 17 years old. Now, I want to draw your conclusion to this, uh, that you know, in his data, 100% right, femoral nerve block success, uh, lateral cutaneous nerve, 92%, uh, obturator nerve, 88%, and then the genital femoral nerve, 92%. And that's what made it very sexy, that's what everyone is dreaming about, uh, that if we do this, uh, we can get these kinds of results. Uh. But the real world situation mm -hmm. is that that doesn't happen. Uh. Captavilla also went on to describe it 10 years later, and he also showed two kinds of spread. In fact, he was trying to define three kinds of spread. Okay, one, uh, the so-called medial spread along the psoas, right? And then one, the lateral spread across the iliacus, and then one, a proximal spread uh, up to the roots. Uh, okay. And what did his data show? That actually, no, there was zone B stretch. Okay, the zone B is actually where the iliacus is. The zone B spread. Uh, was in only about 30%. Zone A and B, okay, about 61%. And then zones A and C, all the way up, uh, is about 
two percent, two percent, no. Okay, and where do you get a hundred percent block of the three nerves? Zone C, A and C. So maybe if you do a fascia lateral block, uh, in two percent of patients, uh, two out of a hundred, uh, you will block all three nerves. But ninety-eight of them, ah, uh, da jalan. You might as well give a femoral nerve block by itself, and you might as well block this separately. So again, they use catheters. It's the same captivator group, right? What they did for these patients is that they actually put the fascia iliaca catheter in first. Okay? They got into the space, they thread the catheter, and then they inject the volume. And then he found that... Okay? Majority of the catheters were in the lateral space, right? Some in the medial space, uh, some in the middle, and then again the same. Only five percent of catheters uh, reach the plexus. Uh, okay? So the success rates, of course, is the same, right? If you are in the uh, near the plexus, your success rates are high, right? But even then, there's a fifty percent uh, uh, obturator nerve block failure. Now, I think the most controversial uh, literature in the last year or so that came out is from uh, uh, Shariat, Ali Shariat uh, in New York, right, Nysara Group. Uh, and they did this fascia electric block with ultrasound, right, and then they found some startling results. Uh. Okay, they did it with ultrasound in a so called uh, infra inguinal approach, uh, uh, in plane, uh, trying to get the uh, needle uh, under the uh, fascia electric and depositing the the uh, local anesthetic uh, and they call this a fascia iliaca block because you know that's what it is for depositing local under fascia iliaca right and wow look at the results man femoral nerve block uh, in only 38 percent of patients no more than 60 percent failure rate no? okay sorry yeah uh, press the wrong button right lateral cutaneous uh, 70 percent failure rate no obturator uh, 75% failure rate, no? How to do? My sure don't do. See? Sham block, zero, 100% failure. Not that far off. Uh. So, MRI studies were carried out by uh, Svensson, uh, and uh, he described them, uh, again, using uh, just uh, putting the uh, needle under the fascia alka and injecting the volumes, and he used the uh, MRI to study the uh, distribution. And what he uh, noticed is that, yes, there is some spread to medially, but they actually don't, uh, he described it as spreading up to the vein, okay, the femoral vein, right? Or uh, up the uh, iliacus uh, to the notch, the uh, ilio and psoas muscle notch, right? And uh, all the way up to the iliac crest. And you look at the results again. Okay. For the fascia iliaca group, uh, we don't look at the three-in-one group. Uh. That's not the study of the day. Uh. The study of the day is the fascia iliaca group. We look at the fascia iliaca group. Uh, the lateral cutaneous extension uh, is, uh, is only in three out of five patients. 60% uh, uh, never reach the lateral edge. Uh. Okay. Sorry, 40% never reach the lateral edge. That means uh, you know these two the spread didn't reach the lateral edge. Okay? And then, uh, if you look at the motor function, right? Um, yes, they all got some form of femoral nerve block. Okay, There's no doubt about it. But none of them got any uh, adduction, uh, muscle power reduction. Okay? So what does, what does that imply? Now, there, nobody really knows how to test uh, or rather, there's no standardized way of testing obturator nerve block success. Uh, but this is probably the closest. Uh, that if the adductor muscle is not weakened, uh, that means you kind of failed. Okay? So I hope I've shown you that this thing, to block three nerves with one single injection in one space, doesn't really happen. Uh. And so what, are the best of, what is the best option? Is there a best option for the hip operation? Uh? Now, you know, you heard of meta-analysis, right? You know, sometimes uh, there's a lot of knowledge out there, there's a lot of data out there, so people are trying to churn it, okay? And this one is being churned in my favor, that's why it's being presented, uh. okay? 
Uh, it's called a multiple treatment comparison. And essentially what they're doing is that, uh, uh, you know, they, they look at, okay, there are studies for A versus B, there are studies for A versus C, but there are no studies for B versus C. So never mind. We'll take A as a reference point and then we will do some statistics uh, and, and see what we can get out, out of this uh, to prove that we can compare all three. Or, right, yes, there's A versus B, A versus C, B versus C, um, but uh, we don't know what is A versus B, so we, we will just uh, compare you know, uh, A versus C and uh, B versus C with indirect evidence. Okay? So this is even weaker than most things are. But guess what? It's working in my favor. So here you go. Okay, so they pulled studies, uh, RRCTs from 1990 to 210. Uh, okay, 2010. That's uh, what, again, uh, stage anxiety. Uh, my maths is so poor. Uh, but there you go. Okay. And you look at all the blocks that were studied uh, for for hip fracture surgery, hip fracture surgery, uh, okay, fascia iliaca block. Uh, this is like the forest plot in meta analysis. Uh, okay, if it crosses the uh, the the vertical line, it's no good, right? More on the left side is good, right? So essentially, we are looking at the fascia iliaca nerve block. Uh, yes, it crosses the uh, onto the left side, but the spread is very big. Uh, that means very variable. Uh, okay. So if you just look at all the suggested blocks uh, on the left column here, what do you see? Uh? You see that actually the, the literature suggests uh, that you should just combine your nerve blocks uh, rather than do one single magic bullet block. Okay? So I think with ultrasound technology, uh, it's actually quite straightforward. Uh. Let electrocutaneous nerve uh, is easy to block. Uh. The femoral nerve uh, is easy to block. Uh. So just you can literally just read the direct needle to block both sides. Uh. Okay, the obturator nerve is also not difficult to block. You need a different entry point. And with ultrasound, it's really not difficult. Okay. Again, uh, using the same data, right? so they, they plotted it another way. Uh, and on the top of the list uh, is actually the obturator and the uh, lateral cutaneous, uh, lateral femoral nerve block. Uh. Okay. So I think I think what this suggests is that actually you should just be blocking the nerve separately if you don't want to do a psoas compartment block. And, and you know, ironically, right, the psoas compartment block uh, is, is quite close to the midline. I guess because the failure rates may be higher. Now, there's also this question of technique, right? We talked earlier in the morning during a live demonstration, there's an infra-inguinal uh, approach, there's a supra-inguinal approach, there's a longitudinal approach, there's a transverse approach. So not all fasciolica blocks are the same. right? So it's really a question of technique and looking for spread. Now with ultrasound, it's easy to get under the fasciolica. There's no doubt about it, you're in the right space. But can ultrasound help us delineate the spread over the iliacus muscle intra-abdominally, retroperitoneally, medially and laterally. I think we're not really there yet. Maybe one day we will be able to ascertain uh, lateral spread, redirect the needle to get lateral spread, and then medial spread, redirect and get medial spread, or ascertain the, the proximal spread up to the root level. But at this point in time, we can only see spread over the curve. We cannot, we cannot nobody has actually described lateral or medial spread uh, on ultrasound yet. Okay. Now, the other kit on the block, uh, you heard about the QL block this morning, right? Well, guess what? These people have done the QL block for total hip replacement or so, uh, for hip surgery, not, not total hip replacement. The two cases in the literature, uh, neck of femur fracture uh, and uh, also a total hip arthroplasty uh, for revision hip. Uh, okay. They were performed using single shot QL1, called Cordesis Lumborum type 1 block. Uh, okay. 20 mils and this one 30 mils, right? They add DEX because I think that's the flavor of the month in the institution, uh, and, and DEX. Uh, in case one, uh, actually the patient was supposedly able to walk within a few hours after surgery. Uh. Okay, Again, this is all balanced anesthesia, right? Because they didn't block the sciatic nerve, they still have to give some form of narcotic. And case two uh, uh, had uh, reported dermatome reduced sensation from T3, T6 to L3. Uh. T3 to L6, uh, T3, T, T6 to L3. I think if you remember what I described to you regarding the superior cluneal nerves, right? The QL block probably has some uh, contribution to blocking that uh, aspect of 
uh, the nerve supply to the area in the hip surgery, and there possibly is some spread uh, towards the uh, lumbar plexus as well. Now, so, you know, looking at all this QL1, QL2, QL3, right, these, everyone's getting confused. Uh, there's literature out there to try to standardize the nomenclature into the anterior or posterior and middle uh, QL fascias, uh, thoracolumbar lumbar fascias. Uh. So I think with that, uh, uh, like the QL uh, is by no means so clear that different approaches will produce identical patterns of spread. Uh. So like for the QL blocks, the fascia ankle blocks are the same. Uh. By no means uh, will you identify the uh, same spread just with that one needle location. In addition, not all blocks are the same. Not all QR blocks are the same. Not all uh, fascia and ACL blocks are the same. So I hope I convince you that you should stop doing fascia and ACL blocks for hip surgery. If you want to do anything, you should do multiple blocks because it's not difficult. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chi. I think because of the time that he spent, then probably most of us will be convinced with his point rather than my face. <laughs> okay, uh, I think in the interest of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But Murphy's blame me because I'm, I haven't enforced the, actually the format. But I think in, in, in the interest of time, we will move on to the next symposium. But I would like to invite the speakers, uh, Dr. Murphy's and uh, Dr. Victor Chi, to, <laughs> to for, uh, please uh, accept your token of appreciation.